I was going to say good morning, but I think it's afternoon here. In New York, it's morning. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here in a packed room to be celebrating the work that's happened over the past year and I guess redouble our efforts moving forward. Um, but before I begin my remarks, I want to echo my thanks to the folks who have contributed to this effort um, and really to echo the comments that Lord Darcy made that um, without strong leadership, none of this work would be possible. Um, either here or in New York City, it's the same. It really is having those um, doors opened, those clear directives for improving the health of a population that make a difference. And so I want to thank the London Health Board, in particular uh, Mayor Boris Johnson. I applaud the work of the London Councils and add my thanks to Simon Stevens, to Chris Hamm, Andrew Ayers, and of course, um, also the work of um, Anne Rainsbury. And I also personally want to thank Una Carney for holding my hand through this process and making my uh, journey here possible. So with that, I want to start off by talking about the work that we've done in New York City and um, share with you some of our challenges, opportunities, and some insights that made our work possible, um, didn't quite get us where we wanted to be, and where we are moving forward. And hopefully, there'll be some lessons learned that you all can incorporate into your second year of this work. Um, and so just to sort of set the stage, um, New York is the largest health center, or excuse me, Department of Health in the country. It has over 6,000 uh, employees and uh, a budget of about $1.4 billion. And so part of what drives our work is that with that amount of money, we really shouldn't have health disparities in our city. And so that's one of the fundamental things that we always look at. And so... The main things that I want to highlight today is to outline the equity framework that we've used for revamping Take Care New York 2020. Um, and at these days, everything has a hashtag. So hashtag TCNY 2020. We will have our official launch next Thursday. So you all are getting a sneak peek. Um, but keep that hashtag in mind. The other thing I want to talk about is highlight the linkages to 1NYC, the citywide document on uh, economic, uh, continued economic vibrancy and sustainability, and then to talk about challenges and opportunities that were presented during this work. So before that, I think it's important to have a sense of the current health status of New York and how it's changed over the last 10 years when uh, TCNY was first uh, released. So this slide illustrates that New York City has the highest life expectancy for any large city in the United States and that we have exceeded the life expectancy of the US as a whole. And so if we were to take that at face value, we could say, work done, we're gonna just chill out. But when you really look at the underlying threads, you see that those gains in life expectancy haven't been equally accrued across the major racial groups in, the United, in New York City. And in fact, we have African Americans with the lowest life expectancy. And so even though all groups have increased their life expectancy, that gap is still something that is of major concern to us and that we want to reduce. We see the same thing in premature mortality. We have seen roughly a 16% decrease in premature mortality in that uh, time period. But when we look at how that breaks out with regards to the different race and ethnicities in New York City, we see that the same gains have not been equally accrued across all groups. And then lastly, with regards to infant mortality, again, we've seen dramatic decreases. And in fact, our overall infant mortality rate in New York City is at an all-time low. But 
when we look at how that breaks out with regards to the races, we see that, the, again, the benefits have not accrued equally. And in fact, one of the ways in which I usually talk about this slide is that the current uh, infant mortality rate for black babies in New York City is 20 years behind that of white babies. And so again, it, it creates urgency for rethinking how, we, how it is that we do our work. And so not only do we see the disparities based on race, but we see how it is that these are geographically distributed. And in the areas there that are darkest, you'll see that they have the highest premature mortality rates. And these are areas that also have the highest rates of poverty, where we have the greatest concentrations of people of color and where we tend to have the worst health outcomes for pretty much every health indicator that you can think of. And so my understanding is that uh, unfortunately London has a similar uh, distribution uh, that it faces as well. And so this again has really influenced the, our thinking in the next iteration of TCNY. And so as I mentioned, these areas light up when you look at asthma hospitalizations, HIV deaths, uh, diabetes uh, deaths, as well as drug hospitalizations. And so that as a framework to remind us that though we have made great strides in the last 10 years, there's still lots of work to be done. And that as a city, we're only as healthy as our most challenged neighborhood. And so that's why, that's part of the uh, revamping of TCNY is really acknowledging not only the importance of considering race when developing interventions, policies, et cetera, but also the complex interplay between race and place in affecting health outcomes. So, our agency has focused on the, these three areas in terms of moving the work forward, bridging the divide between public health and primary health care. And so for us in the US, we've got a different system than here. Um, but the reality is that the payment reform that's been afforded by the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, along with payment reforms that are currently taking place in New York City around um, Medicaid are creating opportunities for public health to flex its muscles and show how it can help the healthcare delivery system meet their bottom lines. Because in actuality, we should have the same bottom line, which is improving the health outcomes of communities. The second priority being promoting a broadened view of what makes a community healthy. Um, all of the things that are outside of public health and healthcare delivery contribute to health outcomes. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then focusing on the youngest New Yorkers um, from before birth to through age three. And so my understanding is that um, the London Health Commission has sort of uh, equally acknowledged the importance of these areas and has, these, uh, has thought about promoting their work through these lenses. And so um, Take Care New York 2020, first issued in 2004. And that version focused on what are the 10 things that an individual can do to have a healthier life. So things like, you know, have a doctor, get your cancer screenings, get your immunizations, all those sorts of great things. It's gone through a few uh, updates and revisions, but the difference in Take Care New York 2020 is that realization that one can be the most motivated individual to follow the instructions of our primary care provider. But if we happen to live in a community where it's not safe, I don't feel safe going outside to exercise, it's not easy for me to get access to fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables, quality of education in my kid's school isn't what it should be or isn't what it is um, in my neighboring community, 
then I can be the most motivated individual, but that won't make a difference because to a certain extent, there are false choices that are put before me. And so recognizing the importance of that, we've revamped T TCNY to have the community as the point of intervention. And what are the things at the community level, what are the structural things that we can do to promote better health? And so this clear change in perspective acknowledges the roots of health inequities, including lack of access to education, medical care, substandard housing, and poor air quality, to mention a few. In addition, we are engaging the community in addressing social determinants of health and the conditions that create, perpetuate health inequities. And we're taking the opportunity to align with existing citywide efforts, and I'll talk a little bit about 1NYC, along with aligning with and integrating with state reforms that I sort of alluded to earlier. So it's a somewhat crowded field, but it creates um, challenges as well as significant opportunities. Um, those challenges essentially being competing priorities uh, and the opportunities, the, the, the excitement of being able to leverage synergies between efforts that are happening. And so we're right in the middle of that. Um, One NYC is a, an update of a plan that was originally released by Mayor Bloomberg in 2007, and it was called Plan YC. And basically it focused on economic growth, environmental sustainability, and resiliency. This year, in April 2015, uh, Mayor de Blasio issued this with a renewed focus on equity, and equity is a central lens in this document. And for the first time, it has an explicit lens on health. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the co-chairs of the work group that contributed to this document. And it's very exciting because we didn't start off this way, but where we ended up is it's an exciting health and all policies document. And we don't typically like to t uh, refer to things these days like that in the United States because it makes us sound you know, like we're trying to take over the world. But in reality, it's the understanding that everything intersects with public health and we all have a role to play in improving health outcomes. And so it's an exciting document that really for the first time gives us an opportunity to link into those other sectors. And it has four visions within it. The one that I'm gonna focus on is vision number two, that our city will be a just and equitable city. And so, Having equity as a, as a major lens, the statement reads, New York City will have an inclusive, equitable economy that offers well-paying jobs and opportunity for all New Yorkers to live with dignity and security. And it highlights the point of, you know, we work on these documents for economic viability, vibrancy, for sustainability, but to what end, for what purpose? And that really being to improve the health of our citizens. And you'll see there the categories that are included uh, within that particular domain. And in the interest of time, I won't go into all of those, but I will highlight some of the uh, areas that we included in this document, one being lift, lifting 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty by 2025, reducing premature mortality 25% by 2040, decreasing and eliminating disparities in infant mortality. So these are bold, ambitious statements that public health by itself can accomplish, nor can the health delivery system accomplish either, but that are imperative for our city to continue to be one of the strongest and most exciting cities in the world. And I'm sorry that Mayor uh, Johnson is not here because I know he's competitive, but so is Mayor de Blasio. Um, <laughs> and so this is sort of the overarching city document. The other document that I want to sort of touch on is our community health profiles. And um, this document was initially released in 2006. The idea being that health, like politics, is local. 
and so that all of these health indicators that we talk about show up differently in different communities. And we've created these new profiles so that each of our 55 communities can see how they are performing with regards to the health indicators. And beyond that, how it is that they compare to citywide averages, to their borough averages, et cetera. The point being that we want communities to have data for action, data for advocacy, and to hold government accountable for their health outcomes, which is, I think, a very um, challenging, exciting, and somewhat scary reframing of the issue, but um, something that we are excited about. And so the uh, profiles are essentially broken up into these categories, which reflect the domains that we have within Take Care New York. And um, they have been widely used in the past. We just released these last week, and so they're on the web. Um, community health, or you could check them out, nyc.gov forward slash community health profiles. And so the, the new aspect of this is that we not only include sort of traditional health outcomes, but we also include things like, um, oh gosh, the percentage of uh, households that have uh, maintenance deficiencies, the percentage of rent burdened households, New York being one of the most expensive cities to live in, and then the impact it has on health. So moving now to um, the new version of Take Care New York. Um, again, October 29th, the launch date, hashtag TCNY 2020. The main uh, point here being that we are interested in every neighborhood being a healthy neighborhood and that the plans we put in place are to improve the health of all of our communities and that most importantly, we are focused on reducing the gap. And so these are the overarching indicators that we have included in TCNY. We were fortunate enough to also have these be the overarching indicators in 1NYC, so we've got a tangible link to that citywide document, which again ties those two together. We have um, highlighted these four priority domains as the domains that we will be focusing in on um, because it, we think that it's easier for people to kind of conceptualize what, we what we're trying to do with these four major buckets. And so each of these priority domains will have leading indicators, not will have, do have, leading indicators for change. And so each of those leading indicators have targeted improvements um, for citywide numbers. And then in addition to that, each of the leading indicators have tar equity targets for the most challenged population within that particular um, indicator, and I'll get more into that in a few minutes. So the first one, and I'm not going to go through, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each of the indicators. I'm going to sort of highlight some for the purposes of example. Um, but you'll see there, looking to increase the number of babies born in uh, baby-friendly maternity facilities, increasing the slots available for center-based care, focusing on decreasing pregnancy, teenage pregnancy and high poverty neighborhoods, and then looking at graduation rates. And so when we look at the um, community health profiles and how they link to TCNY document, um, we'll be able to highlight where we are currently and what the disparities are, and then where we want to be by 2020. And so there are different uh, graphic ways in which we highlight those um, priorities. And then for the community specific reports, communities can go in and see, all right, I live in Mott Haven Melrose, which is in the Bronx, which is the poorest county in the entire New York state. And see where does my community fall with regards to teen births 
and what's the citywide average, what's the borough-wide average, and how does the best, quote-unquote, best performing district look in uh, comparison. And then there isn't a one-to-one -one ratio between the CHPs and TCNY. In some instances, for example, preterm births, it doesn't uh, correlate one-to-one -one with infant mortality, but it looks at what are the major drivers and how do we then stimulate local action around those precursors that can help move the needle citywide. Um, moving on to creating healthier neighborhoods, this is one where we really focus on the role of uh, neighborhood environments in promoting health. And so includes things from air quality all the way through to violence-related hospitalizations, um, the percentage distribution of individuals that are in jail, as well as a measure around social cohesion. And social cohesion is one of the ones that is, well, a number of these are new, but one of the ones where even though we didn't have citywide data, we felt strongly enough that this was an indicator that really exemplified what it was that we were trying to do through TCNY. And so it doesn't yet have um, data behind it, but we have incorporated questions into our community health survey, and we anticipate that by roughly this time next year, we'll have baseline data by community district for this very important measure. Um, and this is just a, an example of how it is that we focus on closing the gap. Supporting healthy living, um, this one is one that sort of compiles all of the behavior related priorities that we've had for the last 10 years and looking to redouble our efforts in ensuring that the benefits are accrued equally across all populations. And so you'll see there lower obesity rates amongst adults and children, uh, continuing to decrease sh sugar sweetened beverage consumption, increasing physical activity amongst adults and children, Smoking reductions, we're at an all-time low in the city with regards to this, but we still have a long way to go. Also reducing binge drinking, fewer overdose deaths, and decreasing daily sodium intake. This is actually a new priority that we've included in this area. Recently, our health board approved a measure whereby every restaurant that's a part of a chain will need to post on its menu board above where the cash register is, all of the items that exceed the national daily allotment for sodium consumption, which, which is 2,300 milligrams. And so fairly soon, we will see those um, stickers go up on the menu boards. And, and I think that will generate a lot of buzz. We anticipate. Um, a lot of uh, interest and ongoing work around that. The point being that after tobacco, sodium consumption is one of the leading modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular death, and so um, we're going after that. Here is um, a graphic that, again, illustrates um, what we see as the citywide targets, but also uh, where we want to see the targets for the most, um, where we see the greatest disparity being that of the African American uh, part of our parts of our city, uh, and this is a graphic that basically shows we are highlighting disparities not only based on race but also based on education attainment as well as geography. So um, the document has a smattering of all of those. The last bucket is improving access to care. Uh, we are currently putting stronger emphasis on mental health, and indeed, our mayor and first lady have uh, put in about $23 million in this past year to strengthen mental health services, and we're excited about releasing our mental health roadmap sometime uh, in November. 
Um, and so we, in this uh, domain, we're also including percentage of adults with unmet medical needs, focusing on HIV, and then also focusing on increasing blood pressure control, again, being a major contributor to uh, stroke deaths in the United States. And as an example of what communities can see in the community health profiles is, again, if I live in Mott Haven, I can see uh, the percentage of individuals who have no health insurance, uh, those that have gone without medical necessary medical care in the last year, and how we are doing with regards to late or no prenatal care. And again, trying to have these data available for action. And so the process by which we are then moving forward on Take Care New York let me just say that in putting together the indicators and the domains, we had a very vigorous debate internally. Uh, we then engaged public health leaders both nationally and internationally, um, as well as leaders of NGOs throughout New York City. Um, and that was a, uh, an iterative process that we learned a lot from. Currently, um, and October 29th will be the first meeting, we are now moving towards community consultations. The idea being that we will share Take Care New York with communities, which is something that we did when we first released Take Care New York in um, 2004. But what's different this year is that we will ask each of these communities to prioritize the indicators, the 26 indicators, within TCNY. The point being that, as I said earlier, there really is no one-size-fits-all, and we want to make sure that we take into account community priorities when developing future interventions for tackling these um, indicators. And so um, we will hold roughly 30 of those and, um, again, excited and a little scared because we've never done something like this before. And so moving now to the um, challenges and opportunities, let me start with indicator selection. So for the first requirement that we had is that each of these indicators needed to have an on ongoing source of data collection um, and that ideally we would want them to have not only citywide collection but uh, granularity at the community district. Some of the indicators like I uh, referred to earlier, specifically social cohesion, we didn't have citywide data, but we were committed to developing that citywide data. Additionally, data on some indicators is still in development, uh, namely the one on sodium consumption. We had done a survey a few years ago that gives us a baseline um, citywide consumption broken down by race, but it's a few years old, and so we are incorporating in this coming section of the uh, community health survey questions around consump consumption. We'll also be looking at some purchasing data to see if we can uh, track changes over time. Additionally, in terms of target setting, this was really one of the more challenging ones internally because our staff wanted to be ambitious, but they wanted to be realistic. And being good public health people, they wanted to choose targets that we could sort of reach before the 2020 timeline. And so part of the framing was to remind them that the indicators within TCNY are not indicators that public health alone can influence. We need the help of all sectors of our city in moving these forward. Secondly, the, the challenge of setting targets for or in some time, in some cases with our sister agencies. That, that was a little bit of a, you know, politically delicate, but we were able to navigate those. And the reality is that the work that we did under 1NYC really helped to kind of break the ice in, in many of those situations. 
And then lastly, um, one of the additional challenges was um, the evidence base for best practices hasn't necessarily been fully developed. And the, I think the best example is in infant mortality. We know what the contributors, contributors are, but from a population health perspective and even from a community specific perspective, we're not convinced that the evidence is really fully there for what are the particular interventions that will make the, the biggest change in bending that curve. And so as part of that domain, we are convening a group of experts um, this month to really start that work and to inform the process um, moving forward. So um, I want to do a time check. You're about on time now. This is the last minute or two. Okay. So I'm going to actually pause there and see if we can have a, a minute or two for questions. But let me just sort of summarize by saying that part of the learnings that we did was that a multi-sectoral approach is critical to improving health outcomes and narrowing inequality gaps. Um, additionally, that leading with race opens up discussion on how existing power structures for making decisions on resource allocation impacts the health of communities, and that focusing on narrowing the gap forces us to be even more intentional on the decision making rather than assuming that benefits of particular interventions will naturally accrue across all populations. So with that, I want to thank you all. So we are tight on time, but one question occurs to me, given our theme is around collaboration and partnership working today. A lot of what you've said implicitly is about working with other agencies, other partners to deliver on your targets and ambitions. What's the biggest challenge in doing that, and what have you learned about how to overcome the challenges? So I think the biggest challenge for us is that um, territory. Right, and so we went into this with a health focus and some of our in sister agencies, I think initially were a little leery of us wanting to quote unquote take over um, agendas. But through the work of One NYC and through the partnerships at our staff, we really came to a place where it's adopting each other's agendas and finding opportunities within funding streams as they become available to, to highlight and to strengthen each other's work. And so, um, you know, focusing on the fact that um, there is work to be done, we can leverage each other's work, and that from a funding perspective, it may actually give us greater opportunities. Thank you. I think you're with us through the afternoon, so yes. perhaps colleagues can talk to you informally during coffee break and extract even more knowledge from you. Thank you very much indeed. Let's show our appreciation Thank again. You. Thank you.